Chapter 7 They were just beginning to reel in Darren when the storm struck. The ground men had noticed a darkening sky. They were scrambling about the field, securing the hangar tent with extra spikes, getting the recruits under cover. Four men strained at the ascender's winch, pulling Darren down steady and fast. A dozen ground crew waited to grab the beast's tentacles when it was low enough. But she was still 500 feet up when the first sheets of rain arrived. The cold drops fell diagonally, hitting her dangling feet even under the cover of the air beast. Its tentacles coiled together, and she wondered how long the Medusa would take this pounding before it spilled its hydrogen, hurling itself toward the ground. Stay calm, beastie, Darren said softly. They're bringing us in. A wild gust caught the Medusa's airbag, and it billowed like a full sail. Darren swung out into the full force of the storm, her boy slops instantly soaked with freezing rain. Then the cable snapped taut, whipping the beast earthward like a kite without enough string. It dropped toward houses and backyard gardens, down to just above the high prison walls. Directly beneath Darren, people scurried along the wet streets, shoulders hunched, unaware of the monster ahead. Another gust of wind struck, and the Huxley was forced low enough that Darren could see the ribs of umbrellas below. Oh, beastie, this isn't good. The Medusa swelled again, trying to regain its lift, and leveled off a few dozen feet above the rooftops. The cable strained against the wind for a moment, then loosened. The ground men were giving them slack, Darren reckoned, letting them climb a bit more, like a fisherman trying to keep a catch on the line. But that extra cable was more weight to carry, and she and the Huxley were both heavy with rain. She could spill the water ballast, but once it was gone, there'd be nothing left to slow their fall if the beastie panicked. The cable was scraping across the prison's rooftops now, snapping against shingles and drain pipes. Darren saw it snag on one of the smoking chimneys, and her eyes widened. No wonder the ground men were letting out more cable. They were keeping her away from the prison. If a chimney spark drifted up and reached the Huxley's airbag, the hydrogen would ignite, the ascender exploding in a massive fireball, rain or no rain. The cable snagged again, sending a jolt through the Huxley. The creature spooked, its tentacles coiled tight, and dropped again. Darren clutched the ballast cord, gritting her teeth. She might survive a wind-tossed landing herself, but the shingled rooftops and backyard fences below would shred the creature to pieces, and it would be all Darren Sharp's fault for not warning the ground men when she'd had the chance. Some air sense. Okay, beastie, she called up. I may have gotten you into this mess, but I'm going to get you out too. And I'm telling you, now's not the time to panic. The creature made no promises, but Darren pulled the ballast cords anyway. The bags snapped open, spilling their water into the storm. Slowly, the air beast began to climb. The ground men gave a cheer and set upon the winch, furiously hauling the air beast in against the wind. The captain was supervising, shouting orders from the back of the all-terrain carriage. The tigeresques looked miserable in the rain, like a pair of house cats standing under a faucet. With a few more turns of the winch, the Medusa was over the proving grounds, safely away from the prison's smoking chimneys. But then the wind switched direction. The air beast billowed again, pulled in a half circle toward the other end of the scrubs. The Huxley let out a screech above the wind, like the horrible sound when one of Da's air bladders would spring a leak. No, beastie! We're almost safe! Darren shouted. But the Medusa had been tossed about once too often. Its gas bag was contracting, the tentacles coiled as tight as rattlesnakes. Darren Sharp smelled the hydrogen spilling into the air, the scent like bitter almonds. She was falling. But the wind still carried them, changing direction without rhyme or reason. It tossed the air beast about like a crumbled piece of paper, pulling Darren behind it. They had to be heavier than air by now, but in a gale like this, Darren fancied you could fly a bowler hat on a bit of string. 
At the other end of the cable, the ground men were watching helplessly, the flight captain ducking as the gyrating cable sliced overhead. If they tried to crank her any closer, they'd pull the air beast straight down into the ground. Jasper was running across the field toward her, cupping his hands to his mouth and shouting something. She caught the sound of his voice, but the wind whipped the words away. Darren's feet now dangled a few yards above the ground, which raced by as if she were on horseback. She peeled off her heavy, sodden jacket and tossed it overboard. The prison loomed close again as the Huxley sped along. Smashing into its walls at this speed would turn her and the air beast into bloody splotches. Her fingers scrambled at the pilot's rig, searching for a way to escape the harness. Darren reckoned her chances were better dropping onto the muddy grass than crashing into a wall. And with her weight gone, the Huxley would rise back into the air. Of course, that Clark rag of a coxswain hadn't bothered showing her how to unbuckle the rig. The leather straps were swollen with rain, cinched as tight as a duck's bum. Evidently, the service didn't trust recruits not to wriggle out in a panic and fall to their deaths. Then Darren saw the knot over her head, the cable that bound the air beast to the ground. She looked at the cable stretch out between her and the winch, about three hundred feet of it now. That length of rain-soaked hemp had to weigh more than one skinny wee lassie in her wet clothes. If she could set the Huxley free, it might still have enough hydrogen to carry her up to safety. But the ground was rising again, shining wet grass and puddles blurring past just beneath her feet, the prison walls ahead. Reaching up with one hand, Darren felt the half-familiar shape of the knot. It was nothing but a backhanded mooring hitch. She remembered Jasper telling her how air service riggers used sailor's knots, the same ones she tied a thousand times on Da's balloons. As Darren struggled to free the wet cable from its knot, her boots struck the ground with a bone-jarring thud, skidding across the wet grass. But the real danger wasn't below, it was approaching prison walls. Darren and the Huxley were seconds away from smashing into that shiny expanse of wet stone. Finally, her fingers pushed the cable's working end free. The knot spilled, the rope twisting like a live thing, skidding her fingers as it slipped through the steel ring. As the weight of three hundred feet of wet hemp dropped away, the air beast soared, clearing the prison walls with yards to spare. Darren's breath caught as a belching chimney passed beneath her feet. She imagined raindrops tumbling down its mouth to the coal fires below, spitting steam the sparks rising up to ignite the angry mass of hydrogen over her head. But the wind whipped the sparks away. Moments later, the Huxley had cleared the southernmost prison buildings. As she climbed, Darren heard a hoarse cheer from below. The ground men raised their arms in triumph. Jasper was beaming, cupping both hands to his face and shouting something that sounded congratulatory, as if to say she'd done exactly what he told her. It was my barking idea, Jasper Sharp, she muttered, sucking her rope-burned fingers. Of course, she was still in the middle of a storm, strapped to an irritable Huxley, both of them soaring across a stretch of London, with precious few spots to land. And how was Darren meant to land this beastie? She had no way to vent hydrogen. No more ballast in case the creature spooked, and no clue if anyone had ever free-ballooned with a Huxley before and lived to tell the tale. Still, at least she was flying. If she ever came down alive, the Boffins would have to admit as how she'd passed this test. Boy or not, Darren Sharp had shown a squick of air sense after all. Chapter 8 the storm felt strangely still. She remembered the sensation from Da's hot air balloons. Cut free from its tether, the Medusa had exactly matched the speed of the wind. The air felt motionless, the earth turning below on a giant lathe. Dark clouds still boiled around her, giving the Huxley an occasional spin. But worse were the flickers in the distance. One sure way to set a hydrogen breather aflame was to hit it with lightning. Darren distracted herself by watching London pass beneath, all matchbox houses and winding streets, 
the factories with their sealed smokestacks. She remembered how Da had said London looked in the days before old Darwin had worked his magic. A pall of coal smoke had covered the entire city, along with a fog so thick that street lamps were lit during the day. During the worst of the steam age, so much soot and ash had decorated the nearby countryside that butterflies had evolved black splotches on their wings for camouflage. But before Darren had been born, the great coal-fired engines had been overtaken by fabricated beasties, muscles and sinews replacing boilers and gears. These days, the only chimney smoke came from ovens, not huge factories, and the storm had cleared even that murk from the air. Darren could see fabs wherever she looked. Over Buckingham Palace, a flock of strafing hawks patrolled in spirals, carrying nets that would slice the wings off any aeroplane that ventured too close. Messenger turns crisscrossed the square mile, undeterred by the weather. The streets were full of draft animals, hippoesques and equine breeds, an elephantine dragging a sledge full of bricks through the rain. The storm that had almost snuffed out her Huxley had barely slowed the city down. Darren wished she had her sketch pad to capture the tangle of streets and beasts and buildings below. She'd first started drawing up in one of Dad's balloons, trying to capture the wonders of flight. As the clouds gradually broke apart, the Huxley slid across a shaft of light. Darren stretched in the warmth and set to squelching water out of her cold, damp clothes. The houses below were getting smaller, the teeming umbrella tops blurring into the wet streets. As it dried, the Huxley was climbing. Darren frowned. To descend in a balloon, you vented hot air from the top, but Huxley's were primitive ascenders, designed to be tethered at all times. What was she supposed to do? Talk the beastie down? Oi! she shouted. You there! The nearest tentacle curled a bit, but that was all. Beastie, I'm talking to you! No reaction. Darren scowled. An hour ago, the Huxley had been so easy to spook. Perhaps one annoyed lassie's cries didn't amount to much after the terrific storm. You're a big bloated bum rag, she shouted, swinging her feet to rock the pilot's rig. And I'm getting bored of your company. Let me down. The tentacles uncurled like a cat stretching in the sun. That's just brilliant, she grumbled. I'll add rudeness to your defects. Passing through another patch of sun, the Medusa made a soft sighing noise, expanding its airbag to dry itself. Darren felt herself drifting higher. She groaned, looking at the blue skies ahead. She could see all the way to the farmlands of Surrey now, and past that would be the English Channel. For two long years, Darren had wanted nothing more than to go aloft again, like when Da had been alive. And here she was, marooned in the sky. Maybe this was punishment for acting like a boy, just like her mum had always warned. The wind steadied, pushing the beast toward France. It was going to be a long day. The Huxley noticed it first. The pilot's rig jolted under Darren, like a carriage going over a pothole. Shaken from a catnap, she glared up at the Huxley. Getting bored? The air beast seemed to be glowing, the sun shining straight through iridescent skin. It was noon, so she'd been aloft more than six hours. The English Channel sparkled not far ahead, set against a perfect sky. They'd left London's gray clouds far behind. Darren scowled and stretched. Barking lovely weather, she croaked. Her lips were parched and her bum was very, very sore. Then she saw the tentacles coiling around her. What now, she moaned, though she'd have welcomed a flock of birds attacking them, as long as it brought the beastie down. A bumpy landing was better than hanging here till she died of thirst. Darren scanned the horizon and saw nothing. 
but she felt a trembling in the leather cords of her pilot's rig and heard the thrum of engines in the air. Her eyes widened. A huge air beast was emerging from the gray clouds behind her, its reflective silver topside glistening in the sunlight. The thing was gigantic, larger than St. Paul's Cathedral, longer than the ocean-going dreadnought Orion that she'd seen in the Thames the week before. The shining cylinder was shaped like a zeppelin, but the flanks pulsed with the motion of its cilia, and the air around it swarmed with symbiotic bats and birds. The Medusa made an unhappy whistling sound. No, Beastie, don't fret, she called softly. They're here to help. At least, Darren assumed they were, but she hadn't been expecting anything quite so big to come hunting her down. The airship drew closer, until Darren could make out the gondola suspended from the beastie's belly. The foot-tall letters from under the bridge windows came slowly into focus. Leviathan. She swallowed. And barking famous these friends are. The Leviathan had been the first of the great hydrogen breathers, fabricated to rival the Kaiser Zeppelins. A few beasties had grown larger since, but no other had yet made the trip to India and back, breaking German airship records all the way. The Leviathan's body was made from the life threads of a whale, but a hundred other species were tangled into its design, countless creatures fitting together like gears in the stopwatch. Flocks of fabricated birds swarmed around it, scouts, fighters, and predators to gather food. Darren saw message lizards and other beasties scampering across its skin. According to her aerology manual, the big hydrogen breathers were modeled on the tiny South American islands where Darwin had made his famous discoveries. The Leviathan wasn't one beastie, but a vast web of life in ever-shifting balance. The motivator engines changed pitch, nudging the creature's nose up. The air beast obeyed cilia along its flanks undulating like a sea of grass in the wind. A host of tiny oars rowing backward, slowing the leviathan almost to a halt. The huge shape drifted slowly overhead, blotting out the sky. Its belly was all mottled grays, camouflage for night raids. In the sudden coolness of the huge shadow, Darren stared up, spellbound, this vast, fantastic creature had actually come to rescue her. The Huxley shuddered again, wondering where the sun had gone. Hush, beastie. It's nothing but your big cousin. Darren heard calls from above, and she saw movement. A rope tumbled into view, unrolling past her. Another followed, then a dozen more, until Darren was surrounded by an upside-down forest of swaying ropes. She stretched out for one, but the width of the air beast's gas bag kept the rope out of reach. Darren swung the pilot's rig, trying to get closer. Her motion made the Huxley's tentacles curl up tight, resulting in a sickening lurch downward. Aye, so now you want to head down? she complained. Just useless you are. The airship's engines changed pitch again, and the dangling lines reappeared, still out of reach. But then the engines overhead set up a grinding pattern, on, off, on, off, and the ropes began to sway in rhythm with the sound. That was one clever pilot up there. The ropes swung closer to the, with every pulse of the engines. Darren stretched out one arm as far as she could. Finally, her reaching fingers caught hold. She pulled the rope in, nodding it to the ring over her rig, then frowned. Were they going to hoist her up into the gondola? Wouldn't that flip the Huxley upside down? But then the line stayed slack, and a few moments later, a message lizard made its way down, its tiny webbed hands cupping the rope as though it were a thin branch. The lizard's bright green skin seemed to glow in the shadows below the airship. It spoke with a posh accent, the deep voice uncanny from such a wee body. Mr. Sharp, I presume? The lizard let out a throaty chuckle. Gobsmacked as she was, Darren almost answered. 
Of course, the message lizard was only repeating what one of the officers overhead had said to it. Greetings from the Leviathan, it continued. Our apologies for the delay, bad weather and all that. It made a noise like a man clearing his throat, and Darren half expected the lizard to raise a tiny fist to its mouth. But here we are at last. We'll be taking you in on the dorsal side, of course. Standard procedure. The lizard paused, and Darren pondered what dorsal might mean. Ah, yes, I'm told you're just a sprog. Well done getting lost on your first flight. Darren rolled her eyes. First a bag of gas and insect guts had carted her halfway across England, and now she was getting cheek from a barking lizard. I expect you don't know standard procedure. Well, it's quite simple, really. We'll drop below you, then come up under, and bring you in on the dorsal winch. Any questions? The message lizard stared up at her expectantly, blinking with its wee black eyes. No questions, sir. I'm ready, Darren said, remembering to use her boy's voice. She wasn't about to admit she didn't know what dorsal meant. The message lizard didn't move, just blinked again. So, standard procedure it is, she added. The lizard waited another moment, but when Darren said nothing more, it scampered back up the rope to repeat her words to whoever was at the other end. A minute later, the other ropes were all hoisted away, but the line attached to her pilot's rig was given more slack. It looped down almost out of sight, a quarter mile of rope it looked like. Then the airship's idling engines sprang to life again. The huge shadow pulled back against the wind so that the sun broke out from behind its nose, half-blinding Darren. The airship dropped then, venting hydrogen with a sound like rushing water, steadily descending till the officers in the bridge windows were dead even with her, only twenty yards away. One smiled and gave a crisp salute, and Darren returned it. The Leviathan dropped still further, and the Huxley whined a bit when one huge eye drew level with them. Don't you give me any more bother, Darren murmured. She was watching keenly, noting how the airship's huge harness wrapped around its body, holding the gondolas in place. The straps were connected by a network of ropes, like the rigging of a sailing ship. Strange, six-legged beasties climbed alongside the crewmen in the ropes, snuffling the air beast's skin. Those had to be the hydrogen sniffers she'd read about, searching the membrane for leaks. When the Leviathan's vast silver expanse slipped beneath her, Darren saw that the other end of her rope was now attached to a winch on the creature's spine. So, dorsal was just service speak for backside. The winch was small and aluminum, made as light as possible, like everything on an airship. Two men cranked it, drawing up the slack quickly enough. Soon, Darren and her nervous Huxley were descending toward the Leviathan's silver back. A few minutes later, a half-dozen crewmen grabbed the tentacles of the Medusa and hauled it down. Darren found herself released from the pilot's rig, stumbling with numbed legs onto the squishy surface of the Leviathan's inflated skin. "'Welcome aboard, Mr. Sharp,' said the young officer in charge. Darren tried to stand up straight, but pain shot down her spine. She wriggled her toes inside Jasper's boots, trying to erase the pins and needles in her feet. Thank you, sir. You all right there? the officer asked. Aye, sir. Just a bit numb in my, um, dorsal areas. The officer laughed. Long flight, eh? Aye, sir. A bit. She sheepishly returned his salute. He was smiling at least. All the crewmen looked rather jolly as they checked over the Medusa. Darren supposed it wasn't often that they were called upon to rescue recruits from the sky. A man in a coxswain's uniform clapped her on the back. Your Huxley's in good shape after a storm like that. You must have a way with the beasties, Mr. Sharp. Thank you, sir, she said. The men at the winch were running the Huxley back up, towing it in the Leviathan's wake. Not many middies spend half their first day aloft, the officer said. I'm not a middie exactly, sir. Haven't taken the tests yet. Darren glanced longingly around the topside, praying that they would let her explore the ship while they took her back to the scrubs. 
She'd be ready to walk again in just a few more minutes. The coxswain laughed. Solving a few aeronautics problems shouldn't be too hard after free ballooning in a Huxley. And with this trouble brewing, I expect the service will be looking for a few more lads. Darren frowned. Trouble, sir? The officer nodded. Ah, uh, yes. I suppose you haven't heard. Some Austrian duke and duchess got themselves killed last night. There may be a bit of a ruckus on the continent. She blinked. Uh, I'm sorry, sir. I don't understand. The officer shrugged. Not sure what it's got to do with Britain myself, but we've been put on alert. Now that we've got you sorted, we're heading straight over to France, in case the clankers try to start something. He smiled. I expect you'll be with us a few days. Hope that isn't a bother. Darren's eyes widened. As sensation returned to her legs, she could feel the rumble of the engines in the air beast's skin. From the spine of the Leviathan, its silver flanks sloping away into oblivion, the sky was huge in all directions. A few days, the man had said. A hundred more hours in this perfect sky. Darren saluted again, trying to hide her grin. No, sir. No bother at all.